Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending where you are. Can you all hear me? Please tell me in the chat. <coughs> yes, perfect. So welcome to this webinar. Today we have Dr. Carlos Naval as a guest who will explain to us how his practice has changed during this pandemic era. And we are very glad to have him today. I will give you just two information about the webinar. If you have any trouble with audio or video, you have a reconnect button in the top right side of the screen. So just click there and you will be brought back to the webinar. All the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. You can leave them in the question section that is below the video because if you leave them in the chat, we may miss them. So it's more comfortable if you leave them there. And now I will let you to enjoy the webinar. Please, doctor, take it away. Doctor for your presentation. Okay, can you hear me? So um, what we're seeing here in Manila is that uh, probably the same thing in your countries where you're on uh, lockdown or some enhanced, we call it here an enhanced community quarantine. Uh, we're not allowed to do on the medical side, elective surgeries. Uh, we only see patients on an urgent case basis. And usually that's in the emergency room of a hospital. Uh, they are planning to lift the uh, quarantine on May 15. Uh, we may actually apply for an earlier um, an exemption in the Philippines because for a healthcare provider, uh, we run an ambulatory surgery center. And most of the time we do cataract surgery. So mostly elective procedures, which I'm sure um, that's probably the same in most of your cases. Now, the thing is when the COVID, uh, COVID actually disappears, um, it's not gonna go away completely um, unless uh, somebody develops a bar uh, vaccine very soon, which is probably not going to be available for I think six months to a year. Uh, just like um, the other uh, viruses like uh, influenza, it's probably going to stay in the community, maybe come out with um, at intervals of uh, epidemic or small epidemic outbreaks. And you have to quarantine some people. Hopefully we can test them very well so we can sort of uh, reduce the number of people who can be lockdown or quarantine. Now the lockdown or quarantine has been proven to reduce transmission and the rate of contagion, but um, it does not confer any immunity. So herd immunity, which is actually what we're hoping for, will probably happen when many people had been infected. And if those in patients who had been infected and survived have actually developed some sort of immunity, then they hopefully do not transmit the virus anymore to other people who are still not immune. The other thing is if many in the community are already uh, immune, then that means the virus cannot jump easily from person to person. Now the advantage of the lockdown or the quarantine is that it pushes the peak or flattens the curve uh, to the right. This is our local uh, curve where you have the yellow orange uh, as the number of cases and we see a sort of uh, reduction in the doubling time of cases. So the more unfortunately or paradoxically the more successful your quarantining is the longer before you reach a peak because that is actually the uh, what you want to do. You want to uh, reduce that curve. So uh, that means that um, when we open, if we're allowed to open, it's the virus is still going to be in the community. The Philippine Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery has come out with a manual restarting after the enhanced community quarantine, which outlines some scenarios or some helpful tips about how to restart uh, your clinic in the post uh, quarantine um, 
um, scenario where you actually still have probably some asymptomatic transmit uh, patients who might transmit the virus, or we ourselves could be transmitting our the virus to our patients. And since we, uh, in, we usually treat the geriatric population, they would be at most uh, risk of uh, developing worse uh, symptoms and also the more likely to die from the disease. So we produce this guide for our patients, which we will give out uh, when they um, come to the clinic. So it's probably not going to be true that we're going to be able to go back to what it was before the COVID. We probably have to um, wear some degree of protective equipment. Again, depending on the guidelines in your country, you may have to wear goggles or face shields. You may have to wear um, N95 mask or some equivalent uh, protection. Then of course, the usual sanitation of hands, sterilization of instruments between patients will probably be more important and probably some degree of physical distancing. So physical distancing, meaning you can't pat the patient on the back, you can't hold the patient's hand. You probably have to wear gloves or um, some other um, protection, maybe use um, swabs when uh, touching their lids or putting their uh, eyelids up or down. You probably have to reduce um, any instrument that has contact with the patient, probably put face shields on the slit lamp. But I think wearing so, many, so much protective equipment during consultations is an unsustainable um, practice because we probably will start relaxing our guard once we're in maybe two weeks into the practice. Maybe you'll find it uncomfortable, unnatural. Uh, it will also add overhead costs to uh, our operation. So I suspect that we may start um, doing shortcuts, maybe not wearing the face shield anymore, maybe uh, maybe just washing hands, maybe still touching the patients occasionally. So what are we actually to do? Well, of course, there's always tele-ophthalmology, but it has its limitations. Uh, some who have tried it have shown that if their light is not good, their internet speed and accessibility also can suffer based on your connections and you still need technical support. Of course, it's very good if it's aided by uh, artificial intelligence, but it's still on the patient side, even if you're not there, it has to be performed by an optometrist or a technician handling the equipment. So you actually reduce the risk uh, on your end, but you shift it to someone else. So the technician becomes the, the person at risk from the patient although you remove the risk of you yourself passing it to that patient. It does reduce travel time for the patient if you have a remote access or a place where you can be, uh, uh, patients can go to that uh, remote area without much uh, travel. You cannot, however, probably perform diagnostic maneuvers that require some manipulation or of course, surgical procedures. So I was thinking maybe we should probably start shifting to contactless ophthalmology. That means compartmentalized patient handling. You have to re revamp or rethink your clinic design. You probably have to design some cubicles or some areas where um, you have complete separation of the clinic staff from the patient. So just like in a bank maybe or in a traditional bank where you have tellers or windows, the patient is guided from window to window. I don't know about in your country, but most of the time in our country, uh, when you have visa applications, there's hardly any personal contact. There's usually a barrier between the interviewer or the processor and the one applying. So it probably is going to be like that and uh, minimal contact with the patient. That's what I foresee that we'll end up doing if you want to keep um, being uh, the instruments for transmitting infection. Although COVID is the one that has come out now, 
and it may disappear with, um, let's say, vaccination or treatment, it's probably not going to be the only one. So there's probably going to be another virus eventually in a few years. So I think we should start learning from uh, this experience. Now, there's technology that um, we can use. This is, of course, nowadays enabled by computerization and paperless transactions, such as electronic medical records, you have cashless payments, and advanced equipment where you don't have to manually handle uh, each aspect of the procedure. One, uh, one example of this is Adaptica's twin. Here you have a refractometer and vision analyzer, which you can perform at a distance, even um, six feet or uh, two meters, uh, whatever the uh, social or physical distancing that is um, uh, recommended in your country. You can imagine here that through a barrier or even um, a barrier with uh, the twin there, you can actually uh, do your refraction with the patient uh, far away from you on the other side of the barrier. Now the Kaleidos is another technology that uh, allows automated measurement. So you actually can be on one side of the barrier looking at the patient and giving patient instructions about how to use the equipment. So you have binocular refraction, monocular refraction, pupillary distance, pupil size. You can see if the head is tilted. Uh, you can check the direction of gaze. You can therefore diagnose phoria, centropias, and very fast and very accurately. So even in children, this is what they designed this for, but I think in the with our COVID um, situation, I think this is a very good thing to adapt. So you don't need a, an automated refractometer where the patient has to put a, uh, his chin on the chin rest uh, and put uh, the forehead against the strap and have a technician there to push buttons because this one is uh, controllable with an application or an app that is on uh, Huawei or Samsung pad. I think that's what uh, Adaptica recommends. Now, of course, the Adaptica Vision Fit SC is the head here that can replace the trial frame and the foropter. So you just uh, have the patient wear it on his head. He can see a chart through uh, the lenses and the lenses have adaptive lenses and you can simulate whatever refraction you got from the Kaleidos. So you can do subjective refraction. And again, it's app-based completely. So you can also integrate it with your electronic records. Now, um, electronic charts are everywhere. So if you prefer an electronic chart, Adaptica has the Acquid chart, it's an HD LED monitor, the difference is that it has more charts. It's dynamic and interactive. And again, it can be controlled by a traditional remote control or using the Acquid app. So you have a working distance for the full LED monitor of two to eight meters. And you also have a mobile version where the patient holds an app uh, either at 0.4 meters, or you can even have somebody put it at five meters when you're testing. So what I dare you to do is to reimagine. So instead of you have um, having a patient right in front of you in the slit lamp, you have this barrier between you and the patient, uh, similar, as I said, to a bank teller or similar to a uh, visa application where there's probably a device where you can hear each other, but uh, there's, a, um, there's something that prevents droplet or aerosol. Uh, transmission and probably some uh, independent air conditioning system. What I wish Adaptica would do is do something like a um, slit lamp with no optics. And this is not really impossible. We have, um, I think you've seen the, some of you may have seen the Artivo from Zeiss. 
where the operating microscope is now um, free from optics. So you can see everything on the monitor using a very low light video camera. And uh, you can use 3D spectacles to see the image in three dimensions. So uh, the same thing happens with the ingenuity of Alcon. And I think uh, if uh, Adaptica or some other company puts its mind to it, maybe they can do this with a slit lamp and uh, probably be able to give us some controls, a joystick or something where we can control uh, the movements of the slit lamp X, Y, and Z. So maybe even change the focus uh, or use an app or a computer uh, to change magnification. So again, you can have the slit lamp on the side of the patient and you can be behind the barrier uh, instructing the patient on what to do. The other thing that we were going to use Adaptica for before the COVID came around was actually to create a mobile eye clinic because of our worsening traffic situation and some uh, invalid patients. Patients have a hard time uh, going through, going to the clinic because of uh, problems. Uh, uh, they're bedridden or they're, they're hooked on oxygen tank because of some pulmonary problem. It will, this set of instruments, uh, I think they call it their refraction uh, set. Uh, you have the uh, you have the vision fit, you have the kaleidos, and you can actually do refraction uh, just using uh, these instruments, which can fit in uh, a briefcase that they give you. So even the kaleidos can be folded, so you can actually bring it around. So this is what actually. I think will eventually uh, be uh, what we go to redesign our clinics for 2021 uh, or 2020 uh, uh, beyond this uh, experience of the pandemic to prevent further pandemics or to reduce another surge or a surge from uh, reinfection. So instead of an open uh, clinic where everybody mingles around and uh, you have the patients uh, uh, very accessible through the clinics, you probably have something like a window uh, where you have a device that uh, um, actually separates the doctor or the nurses or other healthcare providers from the patients. Of course, with emergency access or access when you have to actually touch the patient and probably uh, use uh, protective equipment. But this is, I think, a more sustainable way of uh, keeping the physical distance and reducing transmission without wearing all the gear that you have to change and probably uh, discard every day, if not uh, after every patient. Well, the other thing, this one I just threw in because we were starting to think about the future. I was thinking of uh, the future of IOL technology. Probably it's going to be uh, biometry, aberometry, OCT in one machine. Then you uh, choose your IOL based on uh, the functional vision that you want to give the patient. Uh, it's thrown up to the cloud. Uh, the cloud gives a proprietary plan uh, and throws that proprietary plan based on your choice and the IOL power. Uh, to a 3D printer that sits in your office. And the 3D printer uh, prints the lens, which uh, is then polished and packed. And you can sterilize it in a plasma sterilizer and ready for surgery the next day. So that's just something I threw in, just uh, if uh, somebody else is interested in developing that. So in the end, as uh, Peter Drucker says, uh, the future is really very hard to predict. Um, and the only way probably to predict it properly is to actually help create it. Thank you very much. Now, if anybody has questions, please leave them in the question section. If you need more commercial, 
useful information that are not related to the presentation, just go to the website adaptica.com and refer to your local distributor. You can find information about that still on the website. Now we just wait if anybody has some question. Oh, we have one. Jamie is asking, separation will be difficult for surgical procedures. Yes, that's true. Until we get into robotics, I think uh, uh, that's quite close to impossible. But uh, you see the, pro the advantage of surgery. Operating rooms are almost uh, segregated, except during surgery, you have a patient who's fully gowned. You have a surgeon who's also fully gowned. So all you have to do is probably gown early and include the patient in uh, uh, putting PPEs or putting N95 masks. So I'm not so worried about the operating room because we already usually have some laminar flow, already have some degree of um, a sterilization, you have ultraviolet light, et cetera. So it's quite... Um, it's quite difficult actually, I think, to transmit the infection during the surgery. It's during consultation where we're so used to being very casual, uh, uh, sometimes depending on probably your custom very or your culture very touchy-feely with the patients. That's probably the point where you have more transmission. The operating room, you have masks, you have uh, probably goggles, you probably have um, um, sterilization in between cases anyway, so um, I don't think that's a uh, very big problem. We have a few more questions, doctor, if you scroll down in the question area. Uh -huh. I think some are comments. Uh, I can't answer about uh, when they'll probably be available in the market. I'm not sure it's easy to add face shields to surgery unless you're not going to use the microscope. That's why um, an optic glass, if we have uh, equipment where you're not so dependent on looking through the optics, then maybe we can use face shields. But face shields, if they're not of good quality, can also distort, uh, give you some distortion of the image. I've had um, colleagues who actually complain that they get dizzy after some time of using the face shields. So hopefully Adaptica helps us in uh, continuing our clinics uh, post uh, COVID. And I'm sure you'll find uh, their equipment 
uh, in the right uh, configuration for this barrier or uh, contactless ophthalmology. Okay. Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, I think it's time to end the webinar and thank everybody for joining and thank you, doctor, for accepting to attend the webinar with us. For everybody who thank has any questions, it was an honor to have you. Thank you a lot. Thank for you anybody invitation. else who has more questions, you can write at webinar at adaptica.com. As I said, for commercial information, refer to your local distributors. Also for a promotion that may be ongoing now, like the spring promotion that I leave you here, you will be able to click now. And I wish you have a very nice day or a very nice evening, depending where you are. And thank you very much for attending. Bye, everyone.